so grateful for all of the musicians and worship leaders and all of the folks who have been really coming up to the surface and we're going to see more and more of those type of things here and again it's so good to be back with you and welcome to our guests who are here this morning one thing I'm going to ask you to do is BBS is coming up. This is our significant outreach to our community. We have a wonderful park. We have houses all around. And there's about 40 or so leaders who have said that they're going to be a part of all that's going on. Yeah, and my wife is like, super excited about that, as long as everyone else. And so that's wonderful. So this is what we need. Kids. We need kids, okay? And so if you have children that are planning to attend, please sign up. If you have grandkids who are thinking about coming, please get them signed up. If you have neighbors, like we have neighbors that we've gotten to know intentionally, there is some information on out, out here in various places. Grab a flyer on there. There's a place they can take their phone, bring them right to the registration. They can sign up. That way we can be ready to go. And I'm asking all of us also to be praying, okay? So it's not just something that 40 people do it's something that we are doing okay we are part of the church together and so everyone has a responsibility so if you're not going to be physically present i want you to be praying okay all y'all can pray and please pray pray that young people's hearts would come to know jesus okay that's the ultimate goal about 83 to 87 percent of people when they come to faith do so before the age of 18. These are critical years for kids, it's critical for parents, and we have opportunity to reach them using the vehicle of sports and of snacks and crafts and stories, but ultimately to bring them to Christ. So will you register and reach out? Will you pray for that week-long event that's happening in three weeks in the evening? Lots of information out there. Well, I'm excited to jump into the Word this morning. We have a very significant passage to take a look at. Not that other ones are not significant. <laughs> They're all significant, but lots of information that we're going to look at. So if you do have a Bible, go ahead and open it up on your phone, whatever you have, to John chapter 7. We're going to look at John chapter 7. We're going to take a fairly significant chunk of that. So as you're turning, I'm going to pause. I'm going to pray one more time that the Lord would help me, that it would help us. So God, we thank you for this morning, and we're thankful for a place to gather. God, we're grateful to have friends and family and new people we're meeting this morning. We're grateful that we have your word in a language we can understand. God, we're grateful, God, that your spirit works among us. God, as you know me, I'm just a feeble man with limited capabilities, but you are the ultimate source and you have no limits. God, will you give us today um, um, ears to hear, God, minds to comprehend, and help us to be attentive to what your word would say to us. Help me, God. Help us, Lord. Work among us, God. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I've been a pastor for almost three decades, and it's kind of hard for me to comprehend this. And over those 28 years, I've had um, the privilege of leading people pastorally. I've had some great and wonderful things happen, from wonderful baptisms to marriages being reconciled to people's lives being positively impacted, to sending other people as missionaries and training pastors and all of these things. Now, they're in that positive category, we can rejoice. But there's also, on the other side, some things that are less positive and difficult. For instance, one of the most difficult things, being, again, in ministry for quite a while, is knowing kids, dedicating them as their babies, Eve's my heart. And you perhaps know people that way yourself. Perhaps it's your children or your grandchildren. It breaks my heart when people will listen for at least a decade and then be wooed away by some internet preacher or some person who tickles their ears and they get away from Christ-centered 
biblical doctrines and just float away, drift away, or get into some type of cult that um, wreaks havoc with their life here, but most importantly, um, is detrimental to their eternity. That breaks my heart. Breaks my heart when people misunderstand God in radically unbiblical ways or misjudge people for whatever reason, be it an outward appearance or be become a legalist and become very self-righteous or what have you. These things break my heart and they also break Christ's heart. And so in our passage this morning, um, Jesus helps us in these things. He addresses these things and equips us to know what to do, how to stay faithful and true, and it's important. So I don't know what's going to speak to you this morning. My hope always is that you would gravitate towards one thing. I've said this in the past, sermons don't necessarily make impact, but sentences do, paragraphs do. And so I pray that God would speak to us. So I don't know what's going on specifically, perhaps, in your hearts, in your mind, but you do, the Holy Spirit does. So look for something that God would speak to you today. And as we continue to go through the book of John, okay, and if you've been with us for a while, we are walking through paragraph by paragraph what God would speak to us from this book. From the beginning where John sets up this massive story of who Jesus is and we are following along with him as he is healing, as he is teaching. We've seen him um, distribute loaves and fishes to 5,000. We've seen him walk on water. We've seen him heal a man on the Sabbath day. We're seeing him, and people are continuing to wonder what his identity, who is this? Could this be the Messiah? Is he a moral teacher? Is he a deceiver? And they're flocking to him from all over the place. Some just to get food in their stomachs, some to get healed, some to observe a sign of wonder, and some to listen to this man's teaching and to hopefully discern who this person is about. Jesus, at this point in our, um, the text in the Gospel of John, was at a height of popularity. Everyone was talking about him. Everyone was looking for him. Everyone was wondering about this rabbi named Jesus from Nazareth. And so then we turn to John chapter 7, and we're picking up the story. This is right after Jesus fed the 5,000 and gave this startling teaching about he being the bread of life and, and taking him into our hearts and in him is life. And many left him, but yet so many remains okay so this is john chapter 7 starting in verse 1 i'm reading from the niv version this morning so after this jesus went around in galilee galilee is the northern region judea is in the southern region of israel judea by the way is where jerusalem is where the priests and all of these folks kind of gravitate, kind of the center of worship. So Jesus was staying north around the Lake of Galilee, where lots of his ministry took place. Now, he did not want to go about in Judea because the Jewish leaders were there looking for a way to what? Kill him. They were out for blood. They were paying attention to his teaching. They recognized that he claimed to be the Son of God, and they did not believe that, so they thought it was their sacred duty to kill him. Verse 2, but when the Jewish festival of tabernacles was near, so one of the festivals of Israel, verse 3, Jesus' brothers said to him, 
leave Galilee, leave this region and go down to Judea so that your disciples there may see the works you do. No one who wants to become a public figure acts in secret. Since you are doing these things, show yourself to the world. Verse 5, for even his own brothers did not believe in him. We're going to come back to that. Verse 6, now therefore Jesus told them, my time is not yet here. For you, any time will do. The world cannot hate you, but it hates me because I testify that its works are evil. You go to the festival. I'm not yet going up to this festival because my time has not yet fully come. After he said this, he stayed in Galilee. This is my first point. We have three <laughs> points this morning. And at the end, we're going to recognize communion. By the way, if you're at home, that's going to happen. Get your elements ready. This is my first point from this passage. Believe in Jesus, first part, and trust his plan. Now, there should have been a number of things that jumped out to you from these initial verses. First, that Jesus has brothers. These are physical brothers because coming from the union of Mary and Joseph, okay? We know their names from Matthew chapter 13. Their names are James, by the way, who wrote the book of James in our Bible. At this point, he's not a believer. Their names are James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas. And this is not Judas Iscariot. By the way, the Catholic Church teaches the perpetual virginity of Mary. That is wrong. It's not biblical. Okay? Along with many other teachings... That the Catholic Church talks about, including purgatory, playing the saints, and what have you. Just want to throw that out there, okay? We know their names. These were Jesus's physical brothers. They grew up with God, right? And yet, they didn't Believe in him. How can that be? Now, they had a measure of faith, okay? They believed he could do some supernatural stuff, right? And this passage is, hey, hey, Jesus, why don't you do those things, do those works, you know, that like healing of people that you do, the whole water to wine thing, that was awesome, and all of the stuff you can do, healing people and stuff like that. Hey, why don't you go down there where there's like tons of people going on the city and do that stuff, right? And then people will know who you are, right? I don't know what their motivation was, right? Maybe they wanted to be somebody. They're like, oh, do you know Jesus? Well, <laughs> yes, I do. <laughs> His bedroom was right down the hall from mine, right? I don't know if their motivation was to, um, you know, really help him in his ministry. I don't know what it was. But they were telling Jesus what to do, but they didn't believe who he was. Jesus, the one who never sinned. Jesus, their older brother, they did not believe in him some of you all have grown up in church some of you have children or grandchildren who grew up with God so to speak but yet they don't have faith in him now they may believe that Jesus can do some stuff just like these people right they may know that they can talk to Jesus or talk to God and they will pray at times. And their prayer typically is giving God advice and what God should do, right? Have you ever prayed like that? You probably haven't ever, right? right? Hey, God, 
Now would be a great time for you to do a miracle in my life right now, right? <laughs> hey, God, let me tell you what you should do, right? Come on. Right? People who grow up in church, they believe something about Jesus. <laughs> he can do supernatural things. You can talk to him, right? And they'll pray and advise God to do stuff. But the problem is they don't believe in who he is. Are you hearing me? Now, John's point of writing this gospel, and we've gone over it time and time and time and time and time again, and we're going to go over it again, right? John 20, 31. These things were written so that you would believe. Believe what? Believe that Jesus could do stuff? No. These things were written so that you would believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing in Him, you and I would receive life in His name. At this point in these young boys' lives, they didn't believe that Jesus was the Son of God. And perhaps they even heard um, some stories from their mother about his conception. They didn't believe and they chose that they were going to advise Jesus on what he should do. Excuse me. Just like some of perhaps you in here. Just like perhaps some of your children who grew up with God, talked to God. God did not respond. Jesus did not respond how they thought he should respond. So therefore, they said, mm, I'm going to try something else. Does this sound familiar to anybody in this place? I know it sounds familiar. What did they miss? They missed who Jesus was. We have to tell our kids and our grandkids more, um, more about who Jesus is, right? And not just emphasize all the cool things he can do, right? We love the story of Jesus walking on the water, right? We love the story of feeding the 5,000. We love the story of Jesus raising people from the dead. And these stories are good, but if you get the stories and you miss the person, you miss out. We have to understand who Jesus is. He is the Christ. He is the Son of God. He is the one who has the words of life. To whom else should we turn? If your children understand Jesus' identity, they will follow him versus just looking to him to give them what they expect him to give them. Come on, hear me. This is important. Because if Jesus is the Christ, if he is the Son of God, that means something. That means he's the king. Right? That means he is ultimately the judge. And he says this in this gospel. That means he has authority over what? Heaven and earth. Do you remember this? All authority has been given to me in heaven and earth. Go, therefore... It means he is the creator. He's just not a God amongst God. He is the king of kings. Jesus is not a cosmic bellboy waiting for you to ring the bell so he can give you what you want. Do you laugh? Well, there's people who, who think Jesus is like that. They would never say that. But it's like, hey, Jesus, I got a problem. I think it's a, it would be a really good thing. No, Jesus, you need to do what I want you to do. Just like these boys, right? Hey, Jesus, I know what you should do. You need to go down there, and you need to do those things, and then everyone will know you. That's a good plan, Jesus. 
Look at Jesus' response. Yeah, anytime's the right time for you. Anytime. You want me to do that anytime. You understand that God does have a plan. You understand that? He doesn't need your advice of what to do. You hurt my feelings. Well, your feelings need to be hurt. <laughs> what? God has a plan. There is a massive difference between what a three-year-old knows and what I know. Right? There's a big gap there. There's a greater gap between what I know and what God knows. What you know and what God knows. And I had a three-year-old, right? Like cotton candy. Right? Dad, right now is a good time for cotton candy. It is not. Dad, you're mean. I'm loving. I have a better plan for your life. But children who remain children spiritually demand of Jesus from their unbelief of who he is. Come on, hear me here. This is important. These boys ultimately recognized who Jesus was, put their belief in him, in his identity. We know lots about James who died for this belief. They believed after the resurrection, more than likely. But at this point, they did not. And Jesus says, hey, listen, right? Anytime's good for y'all. But I have a plan. I'm not going down. You go down. I'll go down at the right time, but it's not now. And by the way, I'm not here to do party tricks to have everyone like me. My primary objective is to tell them the truth. The truth is that what they do is evil and they want to kill me for it. So boys, brothers, if you want to get on that wagon, prepare to die. Right? We like the Jesus who makes everything better, right? We don't like the Jesus often who tells us to repent. Are you hearing me? Jesus' miracles were a means to an end, not an end of itself. Was to draw attention to his authority so that they would pay attention to what he had to say that had eternal significance. All of the miracles are always temporary. You're blind, and then you're going to be seeing, and then you're going to die, right? You're deaf, and then you can get a miracle to hear, and then you're going to die. You're hungry, and then you're going to get fed, and then you're going to die. What matters most is eternity, and these things point to who Jesus is, that he is God, right? This is what all of these miracles point to. I've been working hard to point to why he did these specific things, fulfilling Old Testament prophecy, showing that he is indeed God, so that we would believe in him, who he is, and therefore we will follow him as the king of all creation. That's the point. The first thing that you and I and all of us need to do is believe in Jesus. He is the king. He is the one with the plan. He is the one with authority. He knows what he's doing. He's not trying out for the position, right? He's the king. Do you believe in him? Once you believe in him, you get locked in. And you go where he wants to go. You're not there for the show, okay? You're there because you believe in him. The pearl of great price, the one that you have to receive as the bread of life. You understand that? If your kids don't understand that, they're in danger of going and falling away. Hear me. Some of you in here might be in that category. You're here because it feels good, right? We've got air conditioning. <laughs> Do you know who Jesus is? Like, really? Do you believe in him? Not about 
him. In him. Think about what that means for you. And then if you believe in him, you connect that with trusting in his plan. Right? I've had conversations with lots of you, and some of you is like, I'm angry with God. You might be angry with God right now. Oh, that's right. God takes his orders from you. Oh, that's right. You know everything, don't you? Excuse me, I have a cold. But I am warm. Do you understand that he's the king? If God doesn't answer a prayer according to what you want him to do, maybe he has a higher purpose. Would you think that, maybe? He's not out to get you. You know God loves you. Do you know that? You know that he has a, a plan for you. You say, Dave, my husband's got cancer. Dave, my wife's an atheist. Dave, my kid died in a car accident. Dave, and there's tragedies that happen all the time. They're sad, they're difficult. Some of them are demonic, but they happen. Do you believe in Jesus and do you still trust his plan regardless of your circumstances? Most of you do because you're here. People who tend not to be say, well, I'm moving on. What they missed is Jesus is the Christ and he is continuing to work his plan. Do you trust him? Do you trust him? Him. Do you trust him? It will make sense for us in the end, but it doesn't always make sense in the process. Do you trust him? Believe me, he will make it all right in the end. And the end lasts a lot longer than beginning because the beginning is like this. When I say beginning, it's your life. Your hundred years is a drop in the bucket in compared to eternity. Do you trust that he's going to work all things together for good for those who love him and, and work according to his plan, or do you not? So Jesus is addressing this. Crowds are coming to him. People have thoughts for him. People want to kill him. People want to try to use him for various things and say, hey, don't miss the boat, boys. Don't miss the point Boys, any time for you is good for me to do this stuff, but I have a plan. Verse 10. So he has this conversation. <clears throat> and we have to think, do I believe in Jesus? If your kids don't believe in Jesus, point them towards his identity, not necessarily to his works, but to prove the works to prove his identity. And you and I need to trust his plan. And so this text continues on in verse 10. However, then, after this conversation, his brothers left for the festival. And he went also, but not publicly, right? He went privately in secret, verse 11. <clears throat> now at the festival, the Jewish leaders were watching for Jesus and asking. This is the climate that was happening here. Well, where is he? Where's Jesus? Where is he? They're not looking for him to follow him. They're looking for him to extinguish him if they could. Now among the crowds, there was widespread whispering about him. Back corners, private conversations, no one wanted to ask publicly because all of this tension. And some in their whispering said, he's a good man. He is a good man. Well, others replied, no, he's not. He's a deceiver. He deceives the people. But no one would say anything publicly about him. So they're all afraid of the leaders who were going to kill him. So this is the tension. There's more going on than these boys understood. Just like there's more going on uh, around you than you understand either. Jesus understood this. 
They knew this, and it says, I'm going to fulfill my plan, which is different than yours, but it's the right one. So all of this tension is building, looking, talking about who is Jesus, where is he? Verse 14, not until halfway through the festival did Jesus go up to the temple courts. And he began to, what? What did he do? Teach. Not doing miracles like the boy suggested. He's teaching in a very public manner up on the steps of the temple where most people would have been gathered. Here he comes in the middle. Perhaps when they got involved in the people looking at different things, maybe a little distracted. They kind of forgot per se about Jesus and up he comes quietly without fanfare, sits down, starts to teach. Now, the Jews there were amazed. And they asked, how did this man get such learning without having been taught? Right? They weren't talking about how great his teaching was. They're like, eh, obviously he's not smart enough to pull this together on his own. Who taught him? Right? What is this guy about still trying to figure out who he is? Verse 16, Jesus answered, my teaching's not my own it comes from the one who sent me. If anyone wants to do God's will, he will know whether my teaching comes from God or whether I speak on my own. Now, whoever speaks on their own does so to gain personal glory, just like the Pharisees and Sadducees wanted to do. But he who seeks the glory of the one who sent him is a person, a man of truth. There is nothing false about him. Here's the point from this section. Desire God's will and discern true teaching. So here Jesus is. He's stepping up. People are hearing him. The leaders are like, mm, where did this guy get this? And Jesus says, hey, you want to know where I got my teaching? I was sent here. Now, we know who sent him, right? It was his father, right? Jesus sent by God. He says this over and over and over again. I am here, Jesus said, to give glory to my father. What I speak comes directly from my father, him being the begotten son. What he was saying was God's Word lining up with what has been written in any time that anything is said in a religious context, make sure it is connected to the Word of God. Thank you for an amen or two, right? So Jesus says, I am here to bring glory to my Father. And then he says this crazy sentence, right? Verse 17, if anyone wants to do God's will, okay, so if anyone wants to do God's will, that person will know whether my teaching comes from God or whether I speak on my own. Now, this is curious to me. So this means that our motivation matters when we come to Christ or come to his word or hear any type of teaching. Do you and I want to do God's word? People in our day, in our information um, generation, we love our YouTube, right? You guys know what YouTube is, right? right? You, you don't? Ask your wife, bro. She'll tell you. She, uh, <laughs> we have so many talking heads all the time, right? We love to talk about the latest, greatest, whatever it is, right? Be it, hey, have you heard what they say? Hey, have you heard what this say? Oh, this is what this person said. And on 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 and on. The point of the Bible is not to make you more informed. It's not for information. It's for transformation. Right? 
that we would be changed into the likeness of the Son. We would have the desire to follow the Son, to become like Him, and to put into practice what we know. Right? We say, Amen. Do you have a heart that wants to do the will of God? That means you seek the will of God. You look to it. That heart helps us to discern true teaching. And everyone with a microphone doesn't speak the word of God. And I love Rockford, and we got a lot of churches, but not every church speaks the word of God. And you better check me. If I get off the road, say, yo, pastor, you were wrong. Because the word of God says, and let's talk about that. The word is eternal. My word, your word is not eternal. And so this is what I'm asking you to do. Be so bold to say what Christ is asking you to do. Do you have a desire to do the word of God? If you sit here for a decade and your life hasn't been changed in any way towards Christ, we failed. I don't bring the word to you. I have failed. But if you're not putting it into practice, you have failed. Let's not see that happen. The point is it to know more. The point is to be like Christ more. Desire God's will. And then discern true teaching. When you are on TV watching someone, you go to a church down the street, when you hear someone share something with you on TikTok or Instagram or Facebook or YouTube or blah, 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 right? And you all, you all share this stuff. Come on, right? right? Ask yourself the question, who is that preacher trying to bring glory to? Themself? Or Christ. Seriously. We have people with massive followings. Are they bringing people closer to Christ? Or do they want the glory? And they want people to leave that room thinking, wow, what a great preacher. Versus, wow, what a great Christ. There's a difference. Pay attention. Come on. What are they pointing towards? Prophet so and so. And the prophets are going to come back up to the surface. The elections are coming. You remember the last time? And some of you all believe them. It got quiet, didn't it? (laughs) I haven't preached in a couple weeks. Could you tell? (laughs) I do. I'm telling you this because I love you, right? I love you. I love you. I don't want you to get pulled into things that are harmful to you. Pulled into places that will not help you, that will draw you away from Christ, have misunderstandings about God. I just wandered for decades. My dad wandered for two decades, went to Bible school, had a degree, fell away from the Lord, had an affair, joined a cult for two years, for two decades. How did that happen? He tried to find a religion to justify his lifestyle versus a knowledge who Jesus is and I surrender all to follow him. You understand how this is important. So discern, desire God's will, discern true teaching. God, I want to do what you say. Tell me what is true to your word and discern what individuals are talking about. Who are they exalting? Are they trying to get more followers of them? Are they trying to get more people to follow Christ? That's the bottom line. 
my ministry here, my ministry here, will be effective if at the end of the day you remember Christ and you forget about me. Right? I'll be happy about that. You and I will not be in this room forever. 50 years from now, this whole room will look entirely different. And I'll be dead, probably. Right? And so are most of us. What matters is the Word of God. That's why I tell you time and time again, have we ever talked about reading your Bible for yourself? Have we ever mentioned that in here? Why? Know it. Is Jesus the Christ or is He not? If He is, that matters. And if He isn't, then why go to church? Decide who you're going to follow. Me and my house, we're serving the Lord. Where else will we go? Who else are you going to follow? Well, I follow my heart. I'm really sad to hear that. Because your heart is wicked above all things. Well, that's rude. No, that's accurate. I got one too. I ain't following that. <clears throat> I need a new heart. So do you. So here is Jesus right, saying, hey, you know you want to do God's will, Pharisees, right? Listen to me. No, you just want to give glory to yourself. And you see, this is Jesus talking to the Pharisees and these people. Hey, 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 you know that people are following me. You want the glory, so you want to kill me. Because you're about your glory and you're not about God's glory. Even though you say you're about God's glory. That happens today as well. All the time. Discern true teaching. Please, please pay attention to anybody and anything that's sent to you, be it from your grandma or be it from your brother or you find on the internet, come on. Does it line up with the word of God? If it doesn't, stop promoting it. Did what they prophesy come true? Oh, it didn't? Stop following them. Well, they're not perfect. They say they're speaking from God. Okay, let's move on. <laughs> you get the point. Please hear me. Desire God's will. Discern true teaching. It matters. Now then Jesus in, in, interacts with these people, right? So he asks them a question. We're moving towards our last point. Verse 19. So Jesus, in this Jewish context, says this to them. Has not Moses given you the law? And they're like, yeah, we follow Moses. Moses is our guy. Right? Wrote the first five books of the Bible, right? Old Testament. Has not Moses given you the law? And people were there were like, yeah, he has. Of course he has. And then look, the next sentence. Yet not one of you keeps the law. <laughs> then they are fighting words. That's a judgment, by the way. You, you guys say that you follow the Bible? But you don't keep the Bible. This is what he's saying. Like, oh, yet not one of you keeps the law. Oh, why are you trying to kill me? Verse 20, another judgment from the crowd. You are demon-possessed. That's the farthest thing that Jesus is. Right? Polar opposite. God in the flesh, they judge him. You're demon-possessed. Right? You missed it, crowd calling Christ demon possessed the crowd answered and they're like who's trying to kill you Jesus right you're a little delirious 
who's trying to kill you? And they know exactly who was trying to kill him. <laughs> they knew that. Now, with these accusations, this is how Jesus responds. Verse 21, Jesus said to them, you know what? I did one miracle, and you are all amazed. This miracle, by the way, was the healing at the pool of Bethesda, which was right down the street from the temple. He did it when? On the Sabbath, right? And they're saying, you broke the Sabbath, therefore you're a lawbreaker, therefore you can't be the Messiah, therefore you're a heretic, therefore we're going to kill you. That was the rationale here, and they didn't understand the Sabbath. He says, wait a second. So I did one miracle, and you were all amazed. Yet, verse 22, because Moses gave you circumcision, though actually it did not come from Moses, but from the patriarchs, you circumcise a boy on the Sabbath. Verse 23, now if a boy can be circumcised on the Sabbath, which is a work, so that the law of Moses may not be broken, why are you angry, angry with me for healing a man's whole body on the Sabbath? Stop judging by mere appearances, but instead judge correctly. Right. This is the last point from our passage today. Think deeply and judge correctly. Okay. Think deeply. The stuff that's coming at you, okay, that Uncle Bob is arguing with you, or whatever it is, right? Think about it. Think deeper than the surface. What are they getting at? Look towards it, towards Scripture. Wait a second. If what you're saying you think is true, then what about this passage? What about this thing? What about that incident? Right? This is why I want you to know your Bible that will help you to think deeply. Understand it in context. Understand what's going on so you can understand the passage. And so if you hear anything that is contrary to what is written, that you can think deeper about it. So many people just gravitate to the surface. Oh, that sounds good. Right? Give me more of that, preacher. Give me what I want to hear. Bless God. Right? Is that what Scripture actually says? Well, it says it here, but wait a second. What about this, and what about that, and what about this? How does this all work together? Well, don't talk to me about that. Mm, yeah, let's talk about that. Jesus gave him example and saying, hey, listen, you're mad at me for something that you indeed do yourself. There is a reason for the Sabbath. The Sabbath was given for man, not man for the Sabbath. God gave it to us so that good could be done, so that we could be blessed. And what I did, healed the whole person. But yet you're calling me, Jesus was saying, that I'm a hypocrite or I'm a deceiver think deeper Jesus said you call me that I'm demon possessed don't judge on that judge correctly that by the way is a command wait a second Dave we're not supposed to judge right what did this just say it says don't judge by mere appearances but judge Come on, correctly. Oh, our society hates that. Right? We love the, hey, don't judge me. Have you ever heard that before? Well, you have. <laughs> what do you mean, don't judge me? Often we as Christians like, oh, oh, I'm sorry. Sorry. Yeah, do whatever you want. Yeah, it's all good. Newsflash, it's not all good. When people take advantage of small children for their sexual deviant pleasures, that's not good. People lie and cheat and steal and warped in their mind. It's not good. Did Jesus just go around and preach, oh, you all are good. I just love you all. What did he say? Repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. Remember that? Believe in me. I'll give you bread of life. I'll give you 
streams of water. We're going to read that next week. Right? So Jesus' command here, and this is a command, by the way, stop judging by mere appearances, but instead judge correctly. Have you ever judged by mere appearances? I have. Heck yeah. Been super wrong. Thank you for your honesty. We all have done it, right? I bought a car once that looked so nice. Right? I always wanted a cool car. You're laughing at me. You've done it too, right? Oh, it looked good. And I actually <laughs> found it on the internet, the place where all truth abides. And I went there because I needed a car. It was late at night. It looked cool. Sunroof, you know, like really cool. It was like dark. I took it for a drive. I'm like, oh, yeah. I gave it my cash. The next day, the sun came out. <clears throat> Wasn't as great as I thought. I took it to my mechanic. My mechanic was like, dude, this car needs more work to it than you actually paid for it. So Dave called the people back. Ring, 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 you know the story. Finally answered, well, I don't know what to do. You bought it. No guarantees. Click. I paid the price for judging by appearances. I didn't look below the surface. I didn't make a right judgment because I was naive and foolish. Have you ever done that with people? Thank you. We all have done it, right? Oh, I know what all they're about, right? I've been speaking down at the mission probably for 15 years with a pause for COVID. Remember the first time I was, went there, I was scared to death because they're all murderers there <laughs> and drug addicts and blah, 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 blah. Guess what? They're people just like you. I got them completely wrong. Now these are friends who are struggling, right? Just people, right? Have you ever misjudged rich people? Yeah, I have. Right? Oh, they're all snooty. They all then they think they're better than everybody else, and blah 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 blah. I don't want to be nothing like them because they think rah, 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 rah. like when they come up to me, I don't want to talk to them. Huh. You think you're better than me, which isn't true most of the time. We get it wrong because we misjudge, because we don't look at people's heart. We can't get beyond their skin tone or their lisp or their clothing or their car or their location or their education or their drawl or their whatever it is. Stop it. Man judges by the outward appearance, but God judges by the what? Heart. Thank you, King David. You remember that? So any teaching, any person, God help us to make a judgment correctly. And by and large, you as a congregation do this really well. Right? You embrace people. You love them. The thing I hear time and time and time about you all, okay, is what, but I went to Cross Point, and the people there are so friendly. So welcoming, so genuine. Way to go, proud of you. And God help us to make right judgments. Maybe they are struggling. Be more curious than you are judgmental. Are you hearing me? Tell me more about that. Tell me about your story. Everyone in this room has a story. And you can say amen. You all going through something. Right? You all have seen some stuff, right? good and bad. You have strengths and you have weaknesses. You have things that are hurting you and you have things that are helping you. We're all a mix. Learn before you discern, okay? God, help us to see people Rightly, we write people off all the time before we know the truth. James, I got to be done. <laughs> 
tells us to be slow to speak and quick to listen. Some of you all, you haven't stopped talking for two decades. Stop talking. Ask better questions. <laughs> be aware, right? This is Matthew 7. For the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. We do have to be careful. The measure you use, it will be measured to you. If you're judging people because, you know, whatever, they, they aren't doing their devotions, are you doing yours? Oh, you, you're going to measure that against them? Where are you at, Jack? Not saying we aren't to make judgments because we are. But don't be judgmental. Draw conclusions that are accurate and move forward. Okay, coming for a landing. So you need to decide, like I said in the beginning, what you're taking away from this message today. Take away something. Right? Perhaps it's believe in Jesus. Perhaps that's an issue. Perhaps you're struggling with trusting his plan. Maybe that's your issue. Deal with it. Think about your children, what you did or didn't do. Your grandchildren, what, what you did or didn't do with them, point them to Christ. And do you trust his plan? Or perhaps for you today, it's desire God's will to do his will. Most of us don't need more information. We need to do the information that we already have. I'm not up here to like, you know, give you something new. I'm going to remind you of something you already know. Do it and discern true teaching. I don't know who you're listening to. Be discerning, please. Right? Think deeply. Think deeply. Don't lose your ability to think. Goodness, God, help us in this. And then judge correctly. So whatever it is to you, put it into practice, okay? We're going to communion. Last week, and Michael, come on up here, is going to lead us in this. Talked about the bread of life. Talked about these things. Communion, well, I'm not, you're doing communion, not me. Come on up quickly before I keep talking. Okay.